Our second series of How to Fix Democracy is focusing, as you know, on the relationship between capitalism and democracy. And one of the world's leading authorities on contemporary capitalism is Adam Tooze. He's a professor of history at Columbia University and head of the European Institute there. So Adam, to kick off this conversation, let me throw an easy question at you. How would you define capitalism? I think of it, capitalism as a term which we use to do work for us, which has had shifting meanings across time. My academic colleagues who are heavily invested in this will argue the toss about whether or not you think of capitalism as being defined by the emergence of market structures. Um, that would go back to the medieval period or before, and it would extend across the entire world or whether you think of capitalism as being defined by a set of class relationships, basically between people who own capital and those the vast majority of humanity who don't. Uh, and a social order based on that relationship would be what defined capital. An economic system organized around the pursuit of profit is of course another very reasonable definition and one which would have, I think, high relevance for us in the present period. Um, a, a society organized around the trade and the means of production. So one in which land and labor and the contents of our minds, intellectual property itself could become tradable would be another very powerful way of defining what capitalism is. And then we'd have to think about states and politics to wrap our heads around, say, this current situation in China, where in many respects, evidently, we have a form of capitalism operating, but one that is housed within a state apparatus still dominated and ever more resolutely dominated by a legitimate descendant of the great revolutionary era of Marxism. So it's a it's worth noting also that you know that, that, that Marx for instance doesn't talk about capitalism it's only really in the late 19th century that a third second third generation of critical analysts begin even using the term it's the age of the Max Webers the Joseph Schumpeters the late 19th, early 20th century figures who decide they need a label and they begin describing capitalism as a, as a total system. So we've been arguing about it ever since that moment and the argument goes on, but some combination of capital driven by profits or capital accumulation, markets in factors of production, so the commodification of um, labor, capital and land, and the extension of markets on a massive scale and their intrusion into absolutely everyday life. These would be features which many people could agree on. Thinkers about the market were also fascinated with democracy. Uh, classic 20th century economists like Schumpeter and Pagliani in particular uh, were always simultaneously thinkers about capitalism and democracy. Uh, so they established parallel narratives on politics and economics. Do we need those similarly parallel narratives today? For most of their history, you can see why liberalism and the defense of rights and the rule of law exists in some particular cases, not generically everywhere, but in particular cases in a close relationship with the development of capitalism because it's a way of enshrining um, property rights, defending property rights, ensuring a voice for those with property and constraining the arbitrary power of the state so that you can, for instance, have a large sovereign debt regime and nevertheless ensure that the creditors are not, say, in the position of marginalized Jewish creditors to absolutist princes or 19th century princes who can just be, you know, you can simply default on the debt and expel them from the country. If you build a parliamentary structure and the rule of law, then uh, with a constitutional protection for property, then you can see how the positive sum relationship between a property owning class and a state can take on a very dynamic form. None of that implies any particular relationship to democracy, which if, if it's taken at all seriously, implies the involvement and the mobilization of the class of the propertyless. It involves the people um, who, wherever, virtually anywhere, and there've been very few exceptional cases where you're talking about peasant 
nations with very, very low wealth inequality. But in the run of the mill and historically in all the important cases, democracy has been advanced largely as an oppositional project against entrenched elite privilege. And this is the story of democracy in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. It's won by struggle. It's won by the struggle of subordinate nations and empires, and it's won by the struggle of subordinate populations, be they uh, the propertyless, the working class, be they, be they women, be they people of color. Um, and so the proper, the dynamic of, of, of democracy and capitalism is by no means aligned in some sense, uh, the basic Marxist analytic is, is fair enough. In other words, capitalism gives rise to forces and social forces, which are in many ways antagonistic to its basic logic. And those are then subsumed, and this is the surprise of the 19th century. Uh, well, well what, this is what would surprise 19th century observers about the 20th century, is that, that it proved possible to absorb that democratic oppositional pressure into a structure of immense inequality and, uh, and privilege and continued dominance of, of capitalist economic development. And that is the work of the liberals, the work of social democrats, the work of Christian democrats who found ways of stabilizing those, those political forces within the existing envelope. And you can see the stitching and the marrying together of very essentially non-aligned terms like liberalism and democracy going on really from the 1920s. Liberalism and democracy begin to converge during World War I because they're counterposed basically to Germany, to, to militarism and autocracy, allow you then to link liberalism and democracy together. But, but you can register in the thinking of somebody like Max Weber in the aftermath of World War I, the shock at suddenly discovering themselves on the wrong side of history, because that's not how Imperial Germany thought about its position before 1914. It was a modernizing, very inclusive polity in many respects. The German electorate was much wider than that, say, in Britain uh, before 1914. So the marriage of liberalism and democracy and then its alignment with the West and the sense that all of that went together well with something that was coyly described as market economies as opposed to capitalism, that's really an effect of international politics and international political discourse from the from World War I onwards and becomes totally cemented in the course of the Cold War, which then allows a back projection and a, a sort of a uh, tamed version of the sociology of people like Max Weber and Joseph Schumpeter is incorporated into Cold War social science in the 1950s and 1960s, so that then it becomes obvious that the development of capitalism and markets goes hand in hand with the development of democracy, which is why we end up in the West with, you know, that benign mixture that we that we that we could take for granted in the West in the 50s and 60s. So it's a very it's a very complex mixture, and it's quite possible, I think, to imagine. And, and I think it's undeniable that we're witnessing uh, an attrition of the obviousness of that relationship and increasing tensions in that relationship between the development of capitalism now on a global scale and um, national dem democratic uh, politics. Adam, some of the people we've interviewed in the series, Madeleine Albright in particular, have suggested that the economic forces unleashed in the early part of the 20th century in 2008 and perhaps today in 2020 um, are similar to the economic forces unleashed in the 1920s and 1930s. Where do you stand uh, in that debate? Are we seeing the reappearance of fascism? Is history really repeating itself? I'm not keen on this comparison between our current moment and the 1930s. The big difference is total war. I mean, and, 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 and there's, some, there's something almost frivolous about refusing to take seriously um, the shock of World War I. Um, World War I was a, was, a, was a, you know, inflicted losses that no one in our generation can really imagine or, or, or even conceive of the, the degree of, of damage that was done to European society and beyond by the violence between 1914 and 1918. And it was followed by the, by the Russian Revolution, which created Stalinism. Um, and Madeleine Albright, of course, doesn't need any lectures about that. But um, the, the shock of World War I is, is, is devastating and shapes everything. I mean, the, the stakes for the politicians of the 1930s are infinitely higher for all of them. Mussolini, Hitler, Stalin, these are veterans of actual combat. Um, 
you know, really close quarter fighting, who know the fear and the terror of war and have laid their lives, put their lives on the line. And when they talk about, when they talk totalitarian politics, when they talk mobilizing politics, when they demand that people are willing to lay down their lives to whatever political project they're engaged in, they mean it in a way that no one in the current political generation anywhere in the West has any idea, any conception of what that actually seriously means um, on the sort of scale that they were operating. So no, we're not mercifully anywhere near that kind of world. Um, we are, however, certainly in a moment of crisis in 2008, in varying ways, exposed deep fault lines in our societies, profound inequalities, and both managerial incapacity, particularly in Europe, you know, disastrously ill-conceived economic policies, um, which you would expect to be radically delegitimizing and, and have been in various ways. And on the other hand, um, in the American case, you know, the, the, the increasingly toxic way in which social and political conflict in America are processed through you know, to, I'd call it ideology is almost a little bit flattering, but the politics of the GOP, of the Republican Party, have taken on an aggressive partisan form since the 1990s. Some people would trace it all the way back to Richard Nixon, which means that when a crisis like this happens, it takes on a kind of a radical quality, a no holds barred approach to political struggle which is capable of paralyzing the American constitutional system and rendering it essentially dysfunctional. So, so that is what 2008 absolutely did reveal. And no, it's not a crisis on the scale of the 1930s. No, it doesn't suggest the likelihood of a second iteration of total war. Um, that isn't our problem. So for me to go back to your more general question, like history is useful, not just as it were as you know a sort of data set where we go to look for analogies and things which have happened in a similar way in the past. Uh, for me, the essential thing that we struggle to grasp, to call it a lesson is to already prepackage it too much, the challenge of modern history back to its beginning, ever since it started happening in the late early modern period, certainly by the 18th century, has been to understand a series of radical shocks, a series of increasingly novel, dramatic developments. Adam, before we talk about COVID-19, let's talk about the global crisis of democracy. Uh, it's not just in America that democracy is in trouble, it's all over the world, in, in the Philippines with Duterte, in Brazil with Bolsonaro, in Turkey with Erdogan, in India perhaps with Modi. And in all these countries are also experiencing a crisis of economic globalization. So what's the relationship in your view between the contemporary crisis of capitalism, of a globalized capitalism, and this shift towards political authoritarianism? I mean, I'm a little skeptical about treating any of them as you know, symptomatic of a crisis of democracy per se. Um, these are demotic figures. Um, you know, if you if you go back to that 19th century, that classical understanding of democracy, then the, our problem with them is not that they are anti-democratic. Our, our problem with them is that they are illiberal, that they challenge um, rights-based models, that they speak a language which is impolite, um, which doesn't conform to the good tone, if you like, of the late, you know, the 1990s kind of model. We often refer to this as the kind of Davos style, and they, they don't have that style. Um, they may unleash policies in practice, which are indeed in the long run profoundly subversive of any kind of pluralism. And then I think you have to decide in your analysis of democracy how far you value, if you like, the assertion of the people's will over the plurality uh, as as a key element of what you what you would call de democratic, um, but in the first instance, I kind of I'm, I'm uneasy. I mean, it just seems it seems to be, as it were, getting slightly the wrong end of the stick. These are all these are all, in some senses, incredibly demotic people. I mean, they're players of a game which is, in some senses, more democratic, um, but they are very illiberal um, and proudly so. And the question, of course, is, is whether an illiberal democracy, the sort of thing that Orban talks about, 
can really sustain itself or whether liberalism and democracy need to consist, live in some sort of tension. Liberals, of course, have always argued, those who are of a democratic disposition, have always said that in the long run, that kind of demotic authoritarianism spills over into intolerance and then the establishment essentially of one party regimes. Um, another way of disentangling this problem might be to think historically, you know, what is it specifically that strikes us from this point of view of, as it were, the liberal Democrat as so dangerous. And so with Modi in, in India, it's clearly secularism, which folks like Nehru in particular considered to be crucial to the foundation of modern India, was that you preserved, um, as it were, a check on the otherwise obvious dominance of Hinduism. And Hindu nationalism was held at arm's length from the power of the Indian state. That was always clearly a very fragile construction. And that's what Modi and the RSS and his people uh, in the, from that camp are clearly eating away at. In the Turkish case, likewise, in some sense, you know, it's this very twisted and ambiguous legacy of Ataturk's secularist na national project, which Erdogan systematically subverts, and then, of course, resorts to the means of various types of relatively aggressive authoritarianism to suppress dissent. But then, you know, in Turkey's recent political history, that can hardly come as a surprise. Um, you know, there haven't been long periods of stable pluralism with a good protection of the rights of journalists or, you know, dissidents of various types. So I, I think that would be another way of breaking this crisis down. This is where my impulse, perhaps as a historian, to disaggregate comes in. And I would think of the problems, notably of America's political system, as belonging in a rather different category from those of, of uh, Turkey and India, if indeed it's useful to throw any of them into a single pot. Adam, do you think we can strengthen Western democracies if we can begin to fix this crisis of inequality, if we can address the yawning uh, inequalities in economic terms in particular? Uh, absolutely. There's no question. The problem here is what is the we? Uh, in that phrase, and whose interest would it serve to strengthen democracy in your terms? And that, I think, takes us back to the history of democracy, because if, if you understand the history of democracy as the struggle of people excluded from the liberal compromise of the 19th century, which favoured the elites, um, then indeed those two things go integrally hand in hand, but you can also immediately see what the problem is, which is that inequality isn't, act, isn't an accidental fact of our reality. It's not the result of absent-mindedness. Uh, Warren Buffett you know, spoke the truth when he said, there's been a class war in this society in recent decades and my class has won it. Um, and that, cut, that struggle is conducted through by all means, by all means necessary and through all the avenues which American law and the American political system opens to you. And that struggle has been conducted in various more or less discreet ways in Europe as well. And societies like Germany, which we think of as extremely high functioning in many ways, nevertheless exhibit extreme levels of wealth inequality. And indeed, if you look at the results of more sophisticated political science, it's evident that even in polities like that, the political agenda is set to a remarkably disproportionate extent by uh, those with wealth uh, and those at the top of the income pyramid. Armin Schaefer's work is, is absolutely unambiguous on this. Um, so, yes, of course, in term, if you think of democracy as not just simply a neutral constitutional frame which recognises rights and pluralism, but in fact as the political project, a counter a project of counter privilege, if you like, of, of counter inequality, then the two things just go directly hand in hand. We we could live in something that fulfilled all of the formal criteria of democracy. And if it doesn't act as a constant check, it effectively loses its claim to be that. And the, the structures that we inhabit today have very much that kind of property to them, that they are largely compliant and complacent with existing wealth inequality. So yes, absolutely, you're spot on. The question is, who's the we and how does one mobilize the political project um, to redress this imbalance? And, and, and that's where, as a historian, you have to say the challenges are enormous. And the battle has been waged, as Buffett said, over decades in a very systematic way with those with privilege. And this isn't a conspiracy theory. This is just a realistic description of the way in which lobbying, the connections between money and power, 
the extraordinary influence of private ownership over the media, the insistent relationship between advertising um, and the media system, how all of that, um, well, one could hardly avoid saying, conspires to tilt the balance of this argument. So if one is serious about pursuing this agenda, which is very succinctly and correctly formulated as improving democracy by way of um, uh, uh, of shifting inequality, who's the we? And the coalition that was the we, historically, um, consisted of organized labor and its affiliates in the political system, which were social democracy, socialism, and indeed on the left, uh, Marxist communism. And that was the driver. And that at various points in American history has acquired additional components. Um, the civil rights movement was absolutely crucial in shifting the terms of the debate about inequality in the US in the 1960s and 70s. But we know where that battle ended. And it was not a, a, a battle that was won. So that's the that's the challenge. Adam, let's end on a contemporary note. We are in the midst of the COVID-19 crisis, which is also having a severe impact both on our economics and our political life. Do you think we're going to look back at 2020 as a watershed year, not just in terms of the coronavirus crisis, but as the year when we finally begin to address and fix some of the more flagrant abuses not just of capitalism, but of democracy? We don't know. Um, I mean, what we do know is that the obvious political vehicle for a new coalition, um, the uh, Bernie Sanders campaign for the Democratic Party nomination, um, was very unfortunate in its timing. I mean, Naomi Klein likes to talk about historical accidents and their significance, and often I think she's right. And she may be right about this one too, in the sense that the, the, the COVID crisis came, you know, a month too late for the message, the essential truth of the left wing of the Democratic Party's agenda. In other words, that there needs to be comprehensive health insurance in the United States for all citizens, that we need an adequate public health apparatus simply to function, um, for, to have gained the momentum that it might have. And instead, what we're left with is the distinct prospect now, I think, of Joe Biden being elected. Um, and I think it'll be up to the coalition formation within the Democratic Party uh, as to what what colour, what what in what inflection that has. I think it's quite possible that we could look back on this moment, the combination of of the explosion of the long-standing problems of racial violence and discrimination in this society in the in the middle of a in the middle of the crisis of the COVID crisis. Um, it could, it could indeed. It, it's, not, it's not. We can't rule it out. I mean, it's it's difficult for us to to predict at this point. But the my understanding is that the action within the Democratic Party right now is precisely around organising some sort of merger between the centre and the left wing of the party because they recognise how debilitating it would be if. Um, if they didn't mobilise the energy of the Sanders campaign and how inexcusable it would be if they lost the election to Trump on account of having failed to take account of that grassroots mobilization that reached entire constituency, which the mainline Clinton team never could. So I think there may be a sort of residual you know, instinct for self-preservation in the Democratic Party that makes that possible. And, you know, for somebody who, who lives in the US, obviously, we have a lot riding on the success of that. Um, whether out the back of that, they're able then to fashion a genuine package of reform and able to get it through Congress, which is, of course, the fundamental obstacle on which the Obama administration ran aground. Um, that's, that's, those are the big questions. And we shouldn't forget, after all, that, that what we think of as the, the New Deal was an endless struggle. I mean, it isn't just something that was elected into office in, 33, in 1933 and then they had 100 days and they did the deal, right? I mean, the, the, the successive democratic administrations, first of Roosevelt and then Truman, basically had to wage a perpetual struggle. And as many fights as they won, they also lost on key issues, including comprehensive health insurance. Um, and so that if that is the best that we can hope for, then then that's also something I think to, you know, to, to understand about whatever prospects there are um, uh, after after November 2020.